It's all good. Hey, um, hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. That's what I'm missing. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So excited about the new paragraph. <laughs> I don't, I, you mean sentence, you mean sentence, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I am three cents oh. ahead of you. Three cents ahead of you. So <laughs> it's been really beneficial. Yeah, it, it's why I picked this one because I, it, it, yeah, I wanted to go through it really slowly, <laughs> line by line, as they say. Um, time to go. Sorry. <laughs> Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, we're recording. So, uh, welcome back, everybody. Welcome to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And this is part three of our deep dive <laughs> to, into the 700 line. Pranyaparamita Sutra, right? Uh, also known as Manjushri's Discourse on the Pranyaparamita, Transcendent Wisdom. Um, I'm pretty sure I mentioned this at the top of the class, so in lesson one, I'm pretty sure that I mentioned that, you know, this is a Pranyaparamita Sutra, so it's part of a genre of sutras, a family of sutras that all deal with this idea of pranya, transcendent wisdom. Uh, the, two of the most famous are the Heart Sutra and the Diamond Sutra, which should properly be translated as the Vajra Sutra, Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra. Um, but there are, of course, many, many, many other Pranya Paramita Sutras of varying lengths um, with varying characters. Manjushri, our star here, he happens to sort of appear in many of them because he is the, uh, the bodhisattva of prajna. He's the bodhisattva of wisdom. So he tends to be the main presenter of these ideas in, in a lot of the Pranya Paramita Sutras. So this one, this one, the 700 line version is very interesting because interesting this is specifically Manju Shri's discourse on Pranyaparamita. So that's exciting. We were introduced to the sutra with a very simple premise. Manju Shri came to see the Tathagata. And Shariputra kind of came along as well. And when the Buddha asks, hey, Manju Shri, what are you doing here? Well, actually, he asked Shariputra, Shariputra, what are you doing here? And he's like, I don't know. Manjushri got here first. And then the Buddha asks Manjushri, what are you doing here? And he says, I came to see the Tathagata. And, you know, in most instance, instances, that would be like, yeah, look. Well, there he is. There's the Buddha. Top knot, cross-legged, right? Very easy to recognize. That's the Buddha. But the Buddha asks Manjushri, how do you see the Tathagata, the thus come one? And Manjushri gives a very interesting answer to how he sees the Tathagata. Because remember, that's what he came here to do, to see the Tathagata. And so I just a moment ago, I just a moment ago, said, oh, one way you could see the Tathagata is to recognize some characteristic marks of the Buddha, that he has this protruding top knot, not a, a man bun, but an actual protrudence of the scalp called an ushnisha. He's got long earlobes, right? These are the characteristic marks of an enlightened being in a Buddha. 
I'm not going to go through all of part one and part two that from last week and the week before, but I did write on the board here on our virtual whiteboard, I did write one key part of Manjushri's answer. And if you remember, I wrote out all 10 of the ways in which Manjushri sees the Tathagata. And the one that I wrote out is a vi the very interesting one. But for the most part, for the most part, if we kind of back up, Manjushri is kind of saying, oh, if, the, you mean thusness? You mean the thus come one? How, how would I see that? By what characteristic marks Lakshana? By which you, uh, qualities could you recognize the Buddha? Well, I, if I can paraphrase, it's, he's kind of says for a while that I can see the Tathagata as having no marks, no characteristics, not being located anywhere, not being any time or anything. But it's actually even more profound than the unsayable. It's more profound than the unspeakable. It's more profound than ineffability. It's more profound than all of that. Because what Manjushri says is, I see the Tathagata as neither, he, I see the Tathagata as not having any Lakshana, but not not having any Lakshana, right? That's this kind of interesting thing idea. Tathagata is without bu yo xiang, right? Mei yo xiang, no lakshana, doesn't have any lakshana, but is also not bu, not wu xiang, not without characteristics. So this is very interesting, of course. Now, like most sutras, of course, they begin with a question and then this kind of answer that's sort of a, um, a soliloquy or like a monologue where it's like this long answer. And then the rest of the sutra is usually a de, kind of an explaining or a deconstructing of this long, dense intro. So I'm, again, you can either go back and watch part two if you're kind of, uh, if you missed it, but otherwise, I'm going to jump right in. So I'm jumping right in, which is that Manjushri says, yeah, if I'm going to see the enlightened one, see Tathagata, the thus come one, I see the Tathagata as being neither, as having no marks, but not without any marks. And now I'm jumping right back into the text. So the Buddha says to Manjushri, well, if you can see the Tathagata, in this way, your mind will neither cling nor not cling to anything. And it will neither accumulate nor not accumulate anything. <laughs> uh, I, I joked when I first got on the Zoom here that we may not get past that. We might not. One, I, I, wrote, I wrote this on the board the first night thinking that we were going to get there and <laughs> we didn't get there and we didn't get there last time. And we're probably, I should probably like erase that, but we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. So there's, a, you might've noticed there's two things going on in Manjushri's answer or sorry, in the Buddha's uh, response where he's like, wow, if you can see the Tathagata that way, your mind will neither cling nor not cling to anything. And then this other one about accumulate, non-accumulate, hold on to that one. This first one, though, for, you know, us good Dharma practitioners in here, that should be intriguing, this idea of clinging. We know from our Four Noble Truths that clinging is the source of suffering. And so to not cling, according to the Four Noble Truths, or at least the traditional interpretation of the Four Noble Truths, to not cling means the release of suffering, the end of suffering. So the degree to which you cling, you suffer, no clinging, no suffering. That's sort of the, again, the traditional interpretation of the Four Noble Truths. Manjushri took it to the next 
level <laughs> because he's his mind is a mind that will it neither clings nor doesn't cling wow so that's where that's pranya everybody that's what makes transcendent wisdom transcendent wisdom not the very practical very useful understanding of the relationship between wanting and suffering not that very important lesson manjushri took it to a level in which he is he's not even clinging he's not clinging but he's not not clinging either and that of course should sort of jive with this idea of being without marks but also not without any marks it kind of sounds similar in that way of this kind of neither nor and of course one of the ideas that i mentioned either in part one or part two is that to set up this opposition between duality the subject object relationship to set up a a, a an opposition between duality and non-duality is very dualistic and so even the very idea of non-duality is predicated on duality and therefore totally you're wrapped right back in the du in the duel right it's like it it's like um you know what it's like it's like illogical my, one of my favorite ideas is illogical because illogical is logic's tempt attempt to get what isn't in it in it, it it's like well, I must have it all. I must. And so not only shall I have the logical, but I want that which is in isn't. So I will call it the illogical. So Manju Shrizan, he gets that. He understands these things. And so his mind is not trying to settle on anything here in that way. And so the so again, this is the Buddha saying to Manju Shri, well, if you see the Tathagata like that there will be nothing to cling to nor a mind to cling to anything there will be you will neither cling nor not cling it's a very very profound idea the second part though accumulate or not accumulate it, but uh, everybody okay with a uh, clean uh, a mind that neither clings nor doesn't cling like it, it's like I, I can't really say much more about that <laughs> right yeah no well did i hear you say that it's because there's no mind is that what you just said well no but it has to do with like i mean i get the dual the dual duality of non of non-dualism but so let i'll try to reword it so if, if I want to be a kind of Mahayana, classic Mahayana Buddhist, I, I will put down the Shravakas. I'll put down the Shravakayana. And so how, what I mean by that is, is the old school Shravakayana traditional path that Shariputra represents, by the way, allegorically, is the one in which the mind clings to all kinds of stuff, and then the mind gets the dharma, does the meditation and the calming down and reaches a point where it has not, is not doing that. And then it's like, yay, I'm not clinging or, you know, whatever. Manjushri is, it's like, oh, not that clinging mind, but also not that arhat shravaka liberated mind. Oh, that's the... Right on, no. Great question. Thanks for prompting that. Now let's talk about a mind that neither accumulates. What is the language? It will neither accumulate nor not accumulate anything. So this is one that I spent a little bit of time with this morning, deep in the, in the Chinese. Again, I'm kind of reading this from the Chinese, but in Edward Konza's uh, book, The Shorter Pranyaparamita Sutras, there's a version of the uh, translation of the Sanskrit version. So going, looking at, at Kohn's translation, looking at the Chinese, looking at our English translation that we read from, 
you know, there's a lot of language about this in, in Buddhism, the, this accumulation. And it's referring to a lot of things. It could be the development of, of like uh, good or wholesome roots or the development, accumulation that is, of unwholesome roots. And so the mind as a garden getting overrun with unwholesome roots is accumulating. But there's also a kind of deeper psychology about chitta. Chitta is this idea of mind states and the kind of accumulation of kleshas, defilements or afflictions of the mind, greed, hatred, delusion, and this kind of accumulation of the kleshas to create a clouded, deluded, anger-filled, desirous chitta or mind state. And therefore, the practice is this kind of de-accumulation of that. Again, the, the English language of accumulation is a little weird. It's kind of a, little tr a literal translation of the Chinese. I forget what Konza translates it as. Da, da, da. I'm not going to spend too much time looking for it. But ultimately, that's the idea, is the development and cultivation of wholesome roots or something like that, and the getting rid of unwholesome roots or the defilements of the mind. It's, a, it's, it's about looking at the mind, and in particular, mind states, chitta, as these accumulations, and then the pr practice is the deaccumulation of that until the mind is sort of so deaccumulated with defilements that it's perfect. That is again a Shravaka Yana old school way of talking about it. And again, that, that's a great thing to think about and a great practical practice in terms of that our minds do get overrun with this stuff. And it's good to kind of clean house or clear house through shamatha, you know, any number of techniques. So when the Buddha says, wow, if you see the Tathagata that way, then your mind will neither accumulate nor not accumulate. There wouldn't be anything to accumulate in that sense. So... That's a subtler one, a little bit subtler than cling or not cling, is this idea of accumulate. But I really think it's about the difficulty of the language, not any of the ideas per se. Everybody good with that? Questions? Yeah, Tanya. So does that mean like not accumulate even the positive mind states? You're just like not accumulating negative nor positive mind states. You're just nothing. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And I'm very glad you, you, you added that, Tanya, that yes, this is the, the, the wisdom. You brought the wisdom. This is the wisdom that Manjushri and the Sutra is going to be talking about, is that even deeming things as wholesome and unwholesome, good and bad, is a problem. <laughs> and so this mind that Manjushri is advocating, yeah, is like, it's beyond that, but like I said, we're not trying to fall into any kind of dualism here, which would then put an opposition, a further opposition. The mind that doesn't, the mind that doesn't uh, do deal in good and bad versus the mind that does deal in good. You know, you could keep going with the dualisms, and so a lot of the finer nuances of these Pranya Paramita Sutras are in it's delivery of this information where it's trying to be very careful in not setting up further dualisms that way. So awesome comment, Tanya. Okay. This is where it starts to get very interesting, um, uh, logically in a way, but philosophically, because we're going to have these three players. Because Shariputra is about to pipe up. <laughs> And so now we have the old school Shravaka, the really hyper enlightened Bodhisattva Manjushri, and then the Buddha himself in, involved in this conversation. Then Shariputra said to Manjushri, wow. That's why he's got his little hands up. He's like, wow. It's very rare for one to be able to see the Tathagata in such a way as you describe, right? To see the Tathagata 
for the sake of all sentient beings with one's mind detached from sentient beings. It is also very rare to teach all sentient beings to pursue nirvana with one's mind detached from the pursuit of nirvana. And just, we'll get there, we'll get there. So, and, um, and to develop great adornments for the sake of all sentient beings with one's own mind detached from the qualities or characteristics of adornments. All right, that's definitely, that's it, that's it. <laughs> we're, not gonna, we're not gonna do any more than that. That's three major ideas right there. And the first one is the craziest. And the first one is really what I've sort of prepared to speak on. So um, this is just fun. This is just fun, the, the, that third one. But so those are three. And by the way, that was Shariputra saying like, wow, it's really rare for somebody to be able to see the Tathagata like you're talking about. That's like, whoa, that's next level. And then Shariputra, who, who, by the way, you know, Shariputra is really always there to help us. He's really our, our advocate in this. And so he's, he does this a solid by reiterating what Manjushri just said. And so he says, it's very rare for you to see that. And oh, by the way, he says that thing that you see the Tathagata, so like this, this way that you do for the sake of all sentient beings. And if you remember from part one, that was what he, uh, Manjushri said. He said, well, I came here for the sake of all sentient beings to see the Tathagata, <laughs> to you know, apply right mindfulness and see the Tathagata. So Shariputra says, wow, it's very rare for one to be able to see the Tathagata in such a way as you describe for the sake of all sentient beings with one's mind detached from sentient beings. Okay, so we're gonna deal with that one first. The first thing we need to say about this is that the, the translation, this is where the translation just starts to break down and it continues to break down until it's completely useless. <laughs> and so the first place where this starts to break down is that it, it keeps depriving you of a very important word, which is this word lakshana, characteristic, quality, mark, sign, attribute. It's, it, you know, I, I talk about lakshana a lot. It's a very, very important idea, uh, in particular in the Pranyaparamita Sutras. Again, when we're talking about lakshana, we're talking about visible qualities like color, shape, size, number auditory qualities like loud, quiet, shrill, you name it, all the dimensions of sound. We're talking about qualities of smell, uh, putrid, floral, you name it. We're talking about qualities of taste, sweet, sour, savory, umami. We're talking about qualities of the body, of tactility, soft, smooth, rough, hot, cold, and we're talking about qualities of the mind, qualities of ideas, right? Scary, sad, right? These, like, these ideas we have have qualities to them, right? So those are a bunch of lakshana from the six sense organs, right? What the sutra deprived you of is that Shariputra says that Manjushri does this without with one's mind detached from the lakshana of sentient beings. Not detached from sentient beings per se, but detached from the qualities or characteristics or signs or marks of sentient beings. And this teaching, this teaching that we're about to do deep, deep for a, an hour now, this teaching about sentient beings, but actually no sentient beings, 
detached from the qualities and characteristics of sentient beings. This is really, really, really the, the heart, pardon the expression, the heart of the Vajra Sutra, the heart of the Diamond Sutra, the essence of the Diamond Sutra is, and it keeps coming back to it, almost every single chapter of the 32 chapters of the Diamond or Vajra Sutra come back to this idea that bodhisattvas do not cling to or are attached to the characteristic marks of sentient beings, individuality, right? Lifespan, these ideas of um, a being, an individual with a lifespan, born, dying, and then maybe reborn. Bodhisattvas don't cling to those lakshana. And I'm going to attempt tonight with a variety of props and all kinds of things. I'm going to attempt to get us to understand what Manjushri is talking about. And so we need to begin with, well, what are these characteristics and qualities of a sentient being or individual with a lifespan? What are these qualities, right? And in, in more importantly, let's see, what am I going to do? I'm going to use the record tonight. I'm going to use the 45 record tonight. So I'll, I'll start. We'll start. Sentient being, <laughs> sentient being, does this have the qualities, characteristics of a sentient being? <laughs> it doesn't, right? That's how I know I could like uh, flick it and it's okay, right? Because it, it, you know, it's not a sentient being. Sentient being, with, with all of the characteristics, qualities and marks of a sentient being, right? I'm moving, I'm talking, right? Sentient being, not sentient being. <laughs> That's how we normally think of it. That's the idea, right? And so we need to have a very important talk. We, you and I need to have a good talk about these characteristics and qualities, these lakshana, and where they come from and what they are. And I'm going to continue to use my 45 record. And I sometimes have my needle, my record needle. And I used to have a, an actual from my, an old beat up record, a needle from my record player, but it's so tiny. And some people are not fully aware of what that is when I hold it up because it, you know, it's a, just a little piece of plastic ultimately. And so I'm going to use a different sort of stylus or needle. This is my prop, right? And so imagine, and you probably did this as a kid maybe, right? Where you took a needle and ran it on a record and you maybe put a funnel or a cone on the needle and you could hear the record. You didn't even need electricity. You didn't need anything, right? You could hear the music on the record, right? So if if you've done that, great. So, so here's my needle and here's the record. What we're going to be talking about is um, uh, perception, consciousness, consciousness of objects, and how it is happening. And the idea here is, is that well, just to do a quick lesson on dependent origination, because everybody loves quick lessons on dependent origination. The idea is, is that from a Buddhist point of view, you have um, objects, objects, for lack of a better expression, right? And you have sensory organs, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and brain. Those sensory organs could be likened to a record needle. And those sensory objects could be likened to a record. 
And what happens is, is that when your eyeball or your ear or your nose or your tongue or your body or your, your brain comes into contact with some sense media, some object uh, of visible form, auditory sound, olfactory, olfactory scent, gustatory taste, tactile sense, when there is a contact between the two, just like the music that arises when these come into contact, there arises sen uh, consciousness, sense awareness. And when the contact is severed, there is no more arising of that media. There's no more arising of that consciousness. Right now, the, the interesting lesson about dependent origination, my quick lesson about dependent origination is that, you know, we, it, the music's on here, right? But I can't hear it. It's not making any sense. It's not making any noise. No music. So when I hit the contact, boom, and the needle starts vibrating, the needle, the needle actually starts singing. It actually starts vibrating and the sound, the music comes from the needle. You all know this, right? <laughs> this is how it works. Oh, so I don't need this. I don't need that. It's not making any, it's not, it's not making the music. Oh, right? So this phenomena right now, you seeing me is contact between sense phenomena and eyes, and now the emergence of this. Everybody following me on this? Okay. Hold on to that idea, the, the music arising from the contact, but this isn't the music, nor, nor is this the music. It's when the two get together that there's music. Don't get confused. Don't forget it, right? Let's go back. Here's the thing. I've been, I've been trying to think all day about how to exactly convey this message. <laughs> imagine, imagine, if you will, well, imagine that you're seeing me right now, right? But now imagine somebody slipped you some acid, slipped you a strong psychedelic, right? And imagine that all of a sudden my, my earlobe started to get longer, right? And my and a protruding top knot started to emerge out of my skull or something like that, right? The question is, of course, is, do, do I really have a protruding a new ushnisha? Do I really have long earlobes? And if if you were, you know, a normal kind of, you know, cognitive scientist or whatever, be like, no, you you had took the psychedelic; it affected all the stuff, and so what you are experiencing consciously is a distortion. You ever with me on this, right? So then the idea is, is like, oh, okay. So then the next morning, the, the LSD is out of my system. I come back to, to the Zoom class and it's like, oh yeah, okay. He, he doesn't have Ushnisha. He doesn't have long ear lobes. He's back to normal, right? The idea here, of course, is that this again, is like music emerging from the contact and depending, depending on your needle, depending on whether your needle took acid or not, depending on the needle, it's going to, in, he, it's going to interpret the media differently. And so what I'm getting at is that the music that arises from the contact of these two, the characteristics and qualities the lakna of that music 
is not entirely on here. This is a contributing factor. It's not just a, 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 a whatever, a modem or whatever. It's not, it doesn't translate the sound perfectly in that sense. It's a contributor to the phenomena that we experience. That's dependent origination, that it takes two to tango, and that the emerging thing that comes in, the, in between is neither here nor here, but we think it's here. We think it's exclusively here, and therefore we want only this, and we're a little confused, deluded, or ignorant of the contribution that our sensory organs are making to this phenomena, to this experience. Okay, we're not, we haven't fully gotten rid of the idea of sentient beings yet. We're getting warm. That was just the end of the quick lesson on dependent origination. <laughs> Questions, answers, comments, or ideas about that? I th think, Michael, what makes it often so difficult for us um, to understand um, the concept um, of it is because there is the sense of, and now we talked about it, there's the sense of this um, uh, consensus, uh, com consensus reality in a sense of like, that's what materialists say, right? Like that's their ar argument in a sense of, it has a little bit to do with, Eden, uh, it has more to do with reality, but they say as there are different, uh, as we have different consciousness, clearly there is, you know what I'm saying? Then um, there must be something like a independent reality of things. That's what the argument of materialists are, is, right? So I think, um, yeah, I think it, the concept is just difficult because there is a reality we kind of can agree on. Uh, absolutely. And again, like Shari Putra said, it's very rare to have a mind that sees reality or the Tathagata in the way that we're talking about. And just because I can talk about it well, I don't make any claims of actually having that kind of enlightened vision in that way, just to make clear. Connie, we need to go further though. We need to go further because a, a big part of, of it's, it's, this is where it gets very hard. I can just say this, but the, the real impact and import of this is like, it's up to you. The, what I can say is, is that it's one thing to, you know, take uh, this or this or that, take all of these different things and then try to understand or appreciate the contrib contributing factor of the mind or whatever in what I'm experiencing. The big thing though, is that this is true or from a Dharmic point of view, this is true of everything, including like when you look down and contemplate yourself, that too is a music emerging from the contact, which gets wild because it's the experiencer experiencing the experiencer and all of that. But the idea is, is that it's like this emergence of these things that's happening in the in-between of all of this, it, it, it includes you to like in your own sense, sense of self. So the, the mind that we speak of, the brain that we might think we can analyze in an MRI or whatever, all the MRI machine, the mind, the brain, me in the MRI machine, they're all subject to or products of, I should say, this dependently originated reality. And at any point, at any point you put any of it like uh, separated, dualist in any kind of way, it's like, no, 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 no. We were talking about how it's the co-emergence of everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I slipped in the self there because that is the fourth 
the fourth one in the Diamond or Vajra Sutra, that bodhisattvas don't entertain, cling to, or they don't get attached to the characteristics or qualities of a self, individual, sentient being with a lifespan, and not wrapped up in those. And what's, what's the most tricky about that is this sort of, um, well, let me, I'll, I'll, I'm going to start segueing into a slightly different part of the talk to get to how there are this no sentient beings kind of idea. So, okay, yeah, yeah. We, we, Connie already did. Connie's always setting me up. So the idea is, is this. Let's say, you know, uh, I gave, I'm going to point to all the little Zoom uh, windows, right? And so let's say I gave this person a little LSD, but I gave this person ayahuasca, and I gave this person that, and I gave this person that, I gave that person that. And so now we've got, what, 21, we have 21 different people experiencing Michael. And one person took the LSD and I got long earlobes and this and that. And another person took the ayahuasca and I got vines growing out and I'm, you know, an elf, elf, elf machine elf or whatever. And then somebody else took this and I, I'm like, whatever, 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 right? And then the idea is, is like, you know, regarding Connie's comment about like, no, no, but the real Michael, not the person experiencing them that's on that, but that, not on that, not the real one. Yeah, right. Which who's who's got that one? Who 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 who's got the real me, right? Because I would love to know. <laughs> Just kidding. But the idea here is is if you followed my first example, where I was trying to kind of like say, I didn't say it explicitly, so let me say it explicitly. With my first example, where there was just one of you who took acid and all of a sudden I'm growing things. And then, you, and then the next morning you come back to your senses and you see it like it really is. If I were to tie that with my dependent origination, my quick dependent origination talk, the idea is, is that this is a hallucination of your current chemical, biochemical state of mind. And the fact that you tend to eat the same things every day and breathe the same air with pretty much God willing, the same air quality every day and all of that, you keep experiencing this the same way every day. But it's because the intake of your chemistry is consistent. My point being from this, where I'm getting it is, is that, well, let, so now let me tie that into when everybody took all their different drugs. The idea is, is that there is no one absolute real Michael, even for the dude who thinks he's called Michael that looks down every morning at this thing that he thinks is called Michael because he too is on a biochemical trip. You ever follow me on this? Because this is kind of like one of the more interesting no self-talks I think I've ever given. Because <laughs> it this is really what it is pointing at, or at least it is one way to understand the doctrine of anatman or no self, which is the idea of which one? The one that Noam's experiencing, the one that Jenny's experiencing, the one that Kate is experiencing, the one that Michael's experiencing, which, which one? And if you think th there is a real one, an objective one, I ask again, who, who gets to experience that one? What's the angle? You talking about God? Who, what is the angle that gets to kind of decide the, the absolute, real, true Michael? We could right now, I see Connie's light right now, she wants, to, but the idea is we could devolve into a philosophical conversation, a, me, a truly Western metaphysical conversation about this, but this is Dharma. We're talking about uh, our lives. We're talking about how to uh, alleviate our anxiety. And so doing a deep metaphysical dive may not alleviate our anxiety, but what, what may, I don't know, but what may 
is if we were to, through the mind of wisdom or the eye of wisdom, if we were to take a step back and be like, wow, maybe the Buddha's right, that it's all this kind of intersubjective experience in that way, and there isn't one fixed absolute Michael for all time and space and all of that. Maybe I am, even to myself, many. Maybe. So now things are getting a little tricky regarding sentient beingness. Because the idea is, is if I was going to go save all sentient beings, and that meant Jenny and Noam and Katie, right? So these individuals, and I'm just like, wait, have I done it yet? Have I saved them yet? Right? If I'm doing that, I'm going to be waiting a very, 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 very long time. In fact, if I may paraphrase, paraphrase the opening of the Diamond Sutra, the Buddha says, if I, were to, if I were to basically save all sentient beings and cause all sentient beings to enter into nirvana, in reality, no sentient being ever reaches nirvana. And I would suggest that that part of the Diamond Sutra is about that if I think I can save Jenny, Noam, and Katie, the fixed entities in space and time, then again, I will never, nobody, that, no, 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 no. However, this sort of, well, this realization that it's like, oh, oh, wow, there's a lot of us floating around, right? In fact, there's a special little Michael in each of your minds, right? And there's a special, you know what I mean? And, and that is, hi, I'm the special little Michael in your mind being dependently originated from the contact of your sensory organs with this media. Hi. <laughs> Qu questions, answers, comments, or ideas. <laughs> when we talk about this topic, I always often think about Krishna. Murti, who is you know like really famous who basically said or and even you know I obviously David Bohm agreed with Krishnamurti and when Bohm kind of stated the um the observer is the observed right um uh, or the experience is the experience but you know like what you just shared with us and what you see uh, find in, in the different dharma teaching that there is not even an experience an observer there is only such thing, if you will, experiencing, because this is something that we can, not we can agree on because, you know, but there is such a thing as an experience or experiencing. This is something, this is the, I don't know, it's not the foundation, but yeah. So if we want to find something fundamental in everything, then we might can say there is experiencing. Yeah, this is what came up. We might can do that. Absolutely, Connie. Did everybody hear what Connie said? Because she just dropped mad dharma on us all. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so now we might understand a little more clearly when Shari Putra says, it's very rare for one to be able to see the Tathagata in such a way as you describe. To see the Tathagata for the sake of all sentient beings with one's mind detached from the characteristics of sentient beings. It is also very rare to teach all sentient beings to pursue nirvana with one's mind detached from the pursuit of nirvana. So that's our second one. I would suggest that that one, that Shari Putra's like, wow, you like, you're encouraging everybody to reach nirvana without a mind attached to the idea of nirvana. That's sort of along the lines where I was talking about the, the mind accumulating all the defilements or kleshas or unwholesome uh, roots 
And then this sort of idea of like, oh, if I de-accumulate, declutter my house and get it clear, I'm in nirvana. That's kind of the old school Sharaka way of thinking of this. And so when Shari Putra is like, wow, like you're kind of doing this upaya move where you're getting everybody to like, like go seek nirvana, but without like getting wrapped up in the dualism of nirvana, samsara and all of that. Wow. <laughs> Does that make sense everybody? How that kind of correlates to the accumulation, non-accumulation or just to Manjushri's overall uh, position? that he's, he's not attached to nirvana? His, again, the Buddha said, his mind's not attached to anything in that way. All right, then I get to do, then I get to do my, my thing on the, on the adornments. So this is, this is where the translation breaks down, becomes entirely useless. It's also very rare, man. Shri says Shariputra for one to don. This is what the this is what this says to don, like to wear, to don great adornments for the sake of all sentient beings with one's own mind detached from the sight of adornments. That was their attempt to include you in on the deeper conversation about Lakshana. Because what it really says is it's very rare. Well, first of all, it doesn't say to don adornments at all. And this is again where it's like very unfortunate. They, they make it sound like a, uh, what is it? The uh, Technicolor dream coat. I think they make it sound like a Technicolor dream coat or something like that. And <laughs> so there's, uh, this is a lot. So I wrote it on the board. This is the verb. Fa, da, sorry, fa, da, uh, zhang yan, or zhuang yan, fa, da, zhuang yan, that's, that's the Chinese. And this word fa, or it's a first tone fa, it does not in any, any way, shape, or form mean to, mean to dawn, doesn't at all, actually. What? So, oh, by the way, before I even get to the verb, before I even get to the verb of, of like the, the uh -huh of these adornments, let's talk about adornments. This is a personal interest of mine. Um, the idea, it's called a uh, vuha. And this with the, with the da, uh, this Chinese character da means big or great. It's a pictograph of somebody with their arms spread out wide right? It's just big, wide, open arms. It means big. But it's the way the Chinese Buddhists translate maha, great, super, right? And so great zhuang yan, these great adornments. This is a personal interest of mine because I have yet to really figure out exactly what they're talking about. Um, I'm kind of doing, I guess you could call it kind of an archaeology of this term, where I'm kind of digging down the layers of its use within Buddhist texts. Um, first of all, let's deal with adornments. This is something that bodhisattvas are in the business of. They're in the business of these adornments. Yeah, that's what Zhuang Yan means, kind of, sort of. If th this is where it's a little helpful, not so much, but kind of. <laughs> to go to the Sanskrit, um, the Sanskrit, well, no, actually, I'm not going to drop the Sanskrit. Don't, if, if you're familiar with it, fine, but I don't want to, I don't want to add too many layers to this. Adornments is interesting because, yeah, like you can think of like earrings and jewelry, and I actually think it's poetically helpful to think of earrings and jewelry uh, but they're not talking about earrings and jewelry but they are talking in a way about adornments but they're talking about something else and if this is really uh, ambiguous right now trust me i know the idea is is that these bodhisattvas are in the business of these adornments but a more interesting 
trend, and this is where you got to kind of have to be a really heavy linguist to do this, but the word vyuha, so the Chinese are translating the Sanskrit vyuha with these two terms. And these two Chinese terms, zhuangyan, mean adornment. But it's not exactly what vyuha means. And it's not exactly how vyuha is used in Buddhist texts, Sanskrit ones that we know about. A vyuha is sort of, well, it's, it's usually actually the Sanskrit now. The vyuha is usually translated as a arrangement, an array, like an antenna array, but not like an, not, it has nothing to do with antennas. It has to do with an array or an arrangement. You would also find the, the word vyuha to refer to, um, well, a bouquet. So if you want to kind of uh, touch the meaning of arrangement or vyuha, it's like a bouquet, that kind of arrangement. So now let's put all that together and kind of start to wonder more about, okay, so bodhisattvas are kind of involved in these adorning arrangements or something like that. Okay. All right. <laughs> let's talk about this. So this is where the, the translation here is not helpful. I think, I think, um, I think um, uh, the translators of this one got too excited about the earrings and the jewelry. And so they were like, yeah, the Bodhisattva dons great adornments. He put the, he, she puts on great earrings, great necklaces. You've seen the images, right? They got uh, bangles, all kinds of stuff. I don't, and that's again where I think that this, the translators of this just kind of missed it. And the reason why I say that is because these adornments are usually described. And so one of the origins of the language of, of Vyuha is the sutra dedicated to the Buddha, Amitabha, Amitabha the Buddha of infinite life or light. This is a very important sutra. It's called the, just the Amitabha Sutra, Amida Buddha Sutra. But the Sanskrit name is the Sukhavati Vyuha. Of the arrangement of bliss, Sukha. And so why I say this is that in that sutra, Adornments are in the Buddha land. There are things in the Buddha land. So then it's more like a Christmas tree. I, I, meaning, you know, the adorning of a Christmas tree, the adorning of the world. So what I mean to say is, is that if you do a little bit of homework on this term vyuha, you find, oh, bodhisattvas adorn Buddha lands. So they, they go around putting tinsel up. Right? They go around putting little, uh, little lights everywhere. Like, what are you talking about? This is about where my knowledge peters out. I don't know. I don't know exactly what they're talking about. <laughs> if you go digging deeper in the etymology of all of these things and, and their usage, you start to find that the term vyuha has something to do with glory and glorification. Ah, the plot thickens. And if I wanted to confuse you even more, insofar as these Buddha lands are not places, but states of mind, if you go digging even deeper in that archeology span on the term Vyuha, you find instances where the bodhisattva adorns the mind with dharmas, meaning like, but not dharmas, meaning the little, little d dharmas, adorns the mind with truths, principles, things like that. 
so they're doing some serious like inside out kind of stuff where the bodhisattva goes around adorning buddha lands but it's really just their own mind kind of a thing all right now we're getting somewhere I, again don't ask don't ask me <laughs> i don't know i'm <laughs> i'm just giving you all the various information that i've kind of gathered in my archaeology to this point but the most helpful part the really the most helpful part of this is the verb <laughs> fa so this first tone i don't speak chinese very well so i can't really pronounce these things right but this fa is it means um well like to develop to initiate and the most important place that this verb fa the most important place that it is found in buddhism is that it is the verb that is used when a bodhisattva makes the initial determination for enlightenment they they initiate it they develop it they it's the fa, the emergence. It's another meaning of fa is emergence. And so they, a bodhisattva develops or initiates this, this mind of enlightenment. And so that's the verb, to develop or cultivate or initiate. And that's what you do with these mahavyuha, with these great arrangements. You develop them. So now, knowing all that, it is also very rare to, to, fa, to initiate or generate, generate, generates another way of that fa is, is defined, is generate. And you'll actually find uh, English translations of sutras that say generate the initial the initial determination for enlightenment and what they're translating is this word so you generate great adornments right it's also very rare to generate great adornments for the sake of all sentient beings with one's own mind detached from the characteristics or lakshana of adornments <laughs> okay we can talk but no questions because i don't have any answers they got any comments or ideas any feelings about this michael it seems as though um you're kind of describing some of your lessons in the past and uh, like the different jhanas or uh, states that you can achieve through deep meditation and that that's the adornments to me maybe it's just my quirky little cross association but uh, uh maybe these levels of jhana or perception of or non-perception are these adornments on the inside that you're describing yes robert you're exactly right in terms of where and how these things are described yes i do believe i do believe that a possibility i do believe that a possibility is that these adornments are as you say that they are this kind of very poetic way to describe these beautiful glorious states of mind i do believe that that is what they're referring to with this language of adornments but of course if that's the case, which I, I, again, I think is a strong possibility it is, let's not forget what the real lesson is here, though. Manjushri generates these glorious adornments without considering them to be glorious, wonderful, beautiful, better than your states of mind, yada, 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 yada. So the Dharma message is the same, which is about even if we're going to trip out on some beautiful Mahayana language like adornments, even that we do not privilege as better than not adorned, shall we say.
Yeah. Okay. I'm so happy we got to the adornments because again, it's sort of a personal interest of mine. I'm really trying to like dig into this and find out, you know, what, what it's all about. I think it's hardly the, the most important thing here. So I think we should go on. I think we should hear Manjushri's response to Shariputra. So the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Manjushri said to Shariputra, and by the way, the Chinese is wild. It's wild because throughout up to this point in the sutra, Man Ju Shri, there's three Chinese characters that are used to transliterate, not translate, but to transliterate the sound Man Ju Shri. So there's just these three characters that throughout the sutra are used to translate, and the and the the translators stick to that. What's cool, and they left it out, is that right now, for some reason, it is this long string of characters that took me a while to figure out what was going on. And it is the full, fully ornate name of Manjushri. It's like the Manjushri, son of the truth, ever youthful Mahasattva, and it's like, wow, he's, he's sorry. So I, I, w I wanted you to feel what I felt when I was reading the Chinese, where I was like, whoa, yo, oh. So then Bodhisattva Mahasattva, son of the truth, Manjushri said to Shariputra, yes, indeed, what you say is true, even though the translators mis mistranslated it, and so it wasn't true what you said in English, but it was true what you said. It is very rare for one to generate great adornments for the sake of all sentient beings without ever having the notion, sorry, without ever attaching to the characteristics of sentient beings. The realm of sentient beings neither increases nor decreases in spite of generating those great adornments for all sentient beings. Suppose one Buddha dwells in a world for a kalpa or more, and suppose an infant number of such Buddhas, as innumerable as the sands of the Ganges rivers, succeeded one another in dwelling in that Buddha land, each for an entire kalpa or more, to teach the Dharma, day and night without interruption, and to ferry over to nirvana sentient beings as innumerable as the sands of the Ganges River. Yet still, the realm of sentient beings will neither increase nor decrease. It is also true that if the Buddha in all the Buddha lands in all the ten directions teach the Dharma and each ferries over to Nirvana sentient beings as innumerable as the sands of the Ganges River the realm of sentient beings will still neither increase nor decrease why because sentient beings are devoid of any definitive entity or form Therefore, the realm of sentient beings neither increases nor decreases. So this is, um, well, quite directly, um, I don't know quite what to say it is. I don't, I don't want to say it's referencing the Vajra Sutra or the Diamond Sutra. But I already mentioned that the opening, the very opening of the Diamond Sutra, the Vajra Sutra, the very opening is the Buddha saying, I could be sitting here forever ferrying over sentient beings to nirvana. And in reality, no sentient being ever reaches nirvana. Like 
That's what the Buddha says in the Diamond Sutra. And the rest of the Diamond or the rest of the Vajra Sutra is the Buddha explaining what he meant by that. <laughs> What's interesting um, chronologically, again, again, I'm not sure how to think of this, but you know, this is exactly the same message. But what's great about it, thank you, Manjushri, what's great about it is that the Vajra Sutra is rather cryptic. It's rather, um, I don't know how to put it. I mean, the scholar, the scholar in me thinks it's rather arcane. I, I, I think the Vajra Sutra is that initial nugget out of which the rest of this uh, blossomed or flowed in that way. It kind of seems that way. But I don't like to always wear a scholarly hat in that way and be so interested in chronology sequence in that way. But this is a much more or a much clearer explanation of what the Buddha meant in the Vajra Sutra when he said that I could, I could ferry everybody over to Nirvana and in reality, nobody would ever reach Nirvana. I'm surprised, I mean, I'm not surprised, but, you know, when bodhisattvas, um, or there's this, you know, bodhisattva promise, and this includes this notion of, yeah, I will be reborn, you know, as long till every, you know, everyone is liberated or enlightened. Right? No. Oh, no, I'm sorry, can you say again? So there, um, you know, there's this being a bodhisattva kind of includes or... It, it, it says that like they promise or we promise that we are reborn, you know, so many times till everybody is liberated. So I don't know. I really sometimes have a hard, hard time to kind of to bring both ideas together of, yes, there are, you know, sentient beings that want to be liberated or should be, but at the end of the day, fundamentally, there's no such, you know, Thing. Mm -hmm. So, how does Buddha explain that? <laughs> or like, <laughs> like, yeah. So. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best, as always, to 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 do what you just asked. Um, I, here's the thing. So, I, I kind of primed us with my uh, hallucination analogy, where um, uh, each of you would be experiencing a different Michael with different characteristics and qualities based on the particular uh, hallucinogenic drug I slipped you, right? So let's go back to when somebody was hallucinating and they thought I had long earlobes, right? The question is, and we're just, we're just gonna do one tiny little lakshana the length of my earlobe. <laughs> we're just going to do one tiny little lakshana, but we need to be, keep in mind that what we're talking about goes for all characteristics and qualities of all six sense media. So I'm going to use a visual form to, to talk about this, but keep in mind, this is anything you can think of. So if somebody saw through their hallucination that my earlobes got long, so long that they touched my shoulders, right? The question is, are long earlobes a characteristic or quality of Michael? Do, do I have long earlobes or not? If you're sitting there going like, well, I can't really answer that, then you are sitting, abiding in very much the right spot. If you see how it is, given the scenario that I've set up, that I could both have long earlobes and not have long earlobes, because you re you're like, oh no, uh, well, uh, well, you have them to that person but you don't have them to the other person. Yes, that, that is the beginning of what we're talking about. And what I mean by that is, so now I'm gonna try, here we are, 
getting on about 15 minutes or so, try to tie this all together. The idea is, is that that quality or characteristic of long earlobes and this question of whether I have them or not. Again, if you're sitting there and you're like, hmm, well, you know, Michael told me about the record and the needle and the emerging of these things. And now I'm sitting there thinking about somebody that took a hallucinogen and is now like imagining that Michael has long earlobes. And so that person, the Michael in that person's mind has long earlobes, but the Michael in somebody else's mind doesn't have long earlobes. Yeah, yeah, but no, but what am I, but do I have long earlobes or not? Come on, come on, come on. Don't be all eh, emptiness and shunyata. Like, come on, do I have them or not? And if you have finally reached this place where you recognize that the quality or characteristic is not, is not held or possessed by this, it is an emergent property that is just as dependent on the observer as whatever sense media is coming towards the, the observer. It's an originated, it originates there to think that it is a quality of this person. And then to be like, well, I'm a, I only watch, I only go to classes with people with long earlobes and this guy doesn't have long earlobes, so I'm out of here, right? That person would be missing it. They would be missing that the characteristics and qualities are not possessed here. They are emerging in the in-between. Is everybody with me on that? Remember what I said. This goes for all the lakshana. All the lakshana. <laughs> Including, oh, I don't know, something like moving, talking, you know, the characteristics, qualities, and marks of a sentient being versus my non-sentient being. Remember that? Remember how easy it was to distinguish the non-sentient being from the sentient being, and the way that you were do doing that was based on the characteristics and qualities of the thing that you thought this had and this had, and therefore it was so easy to distinguish the sentient being from the non-sentient inanimate object. But now I'm telling you that those very characteristics and qualities of which you're using to perceive these things are there, it's on you. You, they're, they're arising in your mind. And then you're saying, look, sentient being, non-sentient being. Everybody follow me on all this, right? If, if, you, if you tie that together with all of the little Michaels and all, like the idea that there's no one self, there's many selves. If you tie those two together, that's, that's pointing in the direction that Manjushri is talking about which is that these, these finite, definitive, sentient beings, oh, that, by the way, that could be like counted in a census, right? That you could go around and count them all. What happens if we take the Buddha's word for it, that there's not just the one Michael, but there's the Jenny's Michael, Gnome's Michael, Katie's Michael. How does your census work with those? How do you count all of those dependently originated Michaels? I would dare say that they're incalculable, innumerable, inconceivable many, actually. Incalculable. <laughs> so, Michael, so, yes. so is the bottom line like, lesson here basically about dependent origination? Because this seems to be like really super important and like the last thing that we're you know the thing about being ferrying people over to nirvana can you say that again it was like you could ferry people over sentient beings into nirvana but you'd never get everybody there or you'd never reduce the number in that reality no sentient being ever reaches nirvana 
Be okay. All right. So it's not, it's that because it's because of the code. It's because of the, okay. Okay. I had it completely wrong. I was thinking like, you just have to keep doing it over and I, I was, I was interpreting it as like, you just do it for an eternity because there's so many. Right. Nope. But there's, but it, there's no, okay. Okay. Never mind. However, Tanya, just to, to, to say something about the bottom line, important thing here, it's mm -hmm. actually related to, to Connie's kind of more inquiry or feeling about this, like saving all, like that the Bodhisattva vows to save all sentient beings. The, the important follow-up to that, Connie, is while knowing there's no such thing as sentient beings. <laughs> it's even crazier than trying to save all sentient beings. It's doing it knowing fully well that there are no sentient beings. And the real bottom line, practical, important message here is that this teaching that I keep giving about like kind of obliterating objective reality and moving us into a, like a deeply subjective reality. Who, you know, I, you know, there's a lot of people that are brought up this way, but they aren't brought up with Dharma. They aren't brought up with compassion and kindness. They're brought up in a, it, this is a dog eat dog world. And guess what? There's no objective reality. It's just you and your subjective experience. And so maximize pleasure and minimize pain and good luck. So what I'm getting at is that this thing I keep doing of obliterating objective reality and moving into extreme subjectivity is, is possibly dangerous in that sense. It, it, and it could lead to all kinds of things, apathy, all kinds of things, because, well, if these are just all like dependently originated non-beings, then eh. And so the idea is, is it's, it's actually so, uh, uh, Bodhisattva, Kani, Bodhisattva Kani said it about, it's, but the experience, you, that's, there's experience. Yes, exactly. And that's what the Bodhisattva is saving in that sense. But these finite sentient beings, no, 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 no. Bodhisattvas are, are, they're deep in this dependent origination understanding. So that's where it cuts these two ways where it's like, it's a wisdom eye that recognizes this really, you know, tricky illusion of reality. But the compassionate heart doesn't get, you know, flagged by that or dissuaded by that. And that, that is why the Bodhisattva vows to save all sentient beings while knowing or not clinging to any characteristics or marks of a sentient being. Any further questions, comments, or answers? Sweet. We got eight minutes which is actually very cool because that'll allow me to kind of get through this. Well, all this actually does is because we're, we're right here now, we're, we're deep in this hour and a half, hour, 20 minutes, whatever. So I don't want to lose the momentum that we build up over this time. And so I want you to know that this language of, well, the neither increase nor decrease, we all went over. That's what we just went over. Okay. Shari Putra then asked Manju Shri. Whoa, 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 wait. Time out. If the realm of sentient beings neither increases or decreases, that nobody ever goes to nirvana, nobody's ever liberated, if it neither increases nor decreases, why do bodhisattvas, for the sake of sentient beings, seek supreme enlightenment and constantly give discourses on the Dharma? <laughs> Shariputra, all the Shariputra. Why? Like, what? Why? Manjushri said to the Buddha, important, anybody paying attention to the logistics of this, 
notice that Manjushri says to the Buddha, doesn't say it to Shariputra who asked the question, says it to the Buddha. Since sentient beings are empty in nature, bodhisattvas do not seek supreme enlightenment or teach sentient beings. Why? Because nothing in the Dharma I teach is apprehensible. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Dharma the Manjushri teaches cannot be grasped or held. Anybody know why? Come on, you know why. Because <laughs> he dabbles in the dependently originated. The dependently originated cannot be grasped or held, right? Only delusions can be grasped or held in that way. That's why they cause us such frustration. Everybody with me? So, Manager Shri says, uh, da, 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 da. Manjushri says to the Buddha, since sentient beings are empty in nature, bodhisattvas do not seek supreme enlightenment or teach sentient beings. Why? Because nothing in the Dharma I teach is apprehensible. So then the Buddha replies to Manjushri and says, whoa, if no sentient beings exist, why is it said that there are sentient beings and a realm of sentient beings? Ah, yeah, this is... Of, see, these questions are very interesting if you know like what they're talking about. And that's why I love doing these classes because it's like, wow, that's a really, okay, yeah. So then why? If no sentient beings exist, why, is it, why are we even talk, talking about sentient beings, right? Manjushri's answer is the realm of sentient beings is identical or sorry, is by nature identical with the realm of the Buddhas. <laughs> I'm, I, there's more. I'm going to stop with that one and try to unravel that a little bit. I'm sure there's a number of you that are like, well, yeah, because... Because <laughs> Manjushri and Michael just said that all phenomena is dependently originated. And so anything I could possibly think of, whether it's a Buddha or a sentient being or this or that, it goes for all. It's identical. Oh, so the realm of sentient beings is identical with the realm of the Buddhas. Oh, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Questions, comments, ideas? So really quick just this is a fun little if this is a little little kind of cherry on top of this dharma talk cake here I, I this is just a little something for you to think about so go back to my record and i can't find my actual needle so i'll use a pencil but the record and the needle example right This is uh, sort of the realm of form, as it's called. And then the, whether it's my eyeball or my ear or my nose or my tongue, my body or my brain, contact with the sense object and then phenomena, right? And often, and so if we understand that a lot of, if like I just said to you the well do i have long ear lobes or this that these qualities or characteristics are emerging in the in-between right you may have had the thought but so so then what is what is this then like so then what is the object like regarding say objective reality and regarding say like the thing, the thing out there that is causing me to have this hallucination. But what about that, right? I want to give you, and don't, don't worry, two minutes, don't worry. This is just a funny anecdote. 
I want to share you a very funny analogy. It's a very funny way to think about this. So I saw a, um, you know, I, I don't even know what to call these things nowadays. It's not an article. It's not a headline. It's not a meme. I saw one of these things that floats around, right? And it was about somebody who had gotten the, um, you know, those, um, what are they called? The QR codes or something, those blocks of black squares. What are those called? QR code? I'm seeing a lot of head. All right. So I saw that somebody had gotten a tattoo of a QR code so that when he used the app on the phone, what emerged on his phone was his favorite soccer team winning uh, the, the, the World Cup. Does everybody in the Zoom room understand how, that, how we live in such a world where something like that is like ma madly possible, right? Everybody's good on that, right? The funny thing about it is, is that somebody changed the link. And so when he does the thing, what comes up is, I don't even know what, the Teletubbies or something. So use that the next time you're, you're curious about the realm of pure form and this idea of like, but there must be something out there that kind of corresponds to what I'm experiencing. Dependent origination is real. <laughs> and that's a funny example of dependent origination, but also how what this is is not fixed. All right, folks, that's my funny little ender there. Think twice before you get those tattoos. Uh, <laughs> um, and thank you all so much for being here. Great time. It was a great, great night. Had a lot of fun. <laughs> Michael, I think you're a little 45. You know, it should be from the band Nirvana. Uh, sorry, I've got to get, get a Nirvana 45. Seriously. Gotta, like that's <laughs> that's going to be fun. I'm going to do it. And, and by the way, I, all, I got these new lights, but they're battery operated. So I've been getting oranger all night because they keep going out. <laughs> so it's, it's been kind of fun to like watch this slow digression. I should kind of like start to do a slow fade out. <laughs> Maybe it's just Michael, the gas my coffee. You know. what, what's up, Noam? Oh, I just wanted to say a couple of things. I, I, was, I was going to say that the, I'm distracted from dependent, in, in, dependent origination by the story about the tattoo. And the, and, the, and the real moral of that story is think twice before you get the tattoo. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to uh, take the opportunity to say that our little sangha here is, is dependently originated. It, it arises from... Michael's presence and your presence and um, you know little little electrons flying through the air but thank you all for being here uh, we also <laughs> no, we, <laughs> we also do depend on Donna so if you're able to please uh, do participate um, Katie put the link in the chat and if you are not able to this evening, that is okay. We really, really want you to, uh, <laughs> Katie, you're distracting me, uh, to be here. Uh, and if, I thought you were gonna say, if you wanna see Michael with long earlobes, come on Friday, because this coming Friday, oh, right. Michael will be here with some sort of earlobes. <laughs> you know what, Michael? What's that? It's, it's a reprise of of my dharma bums the kind of how buddhism came to america uh it's a talk i've been giving for a very long time i gave it at the sfdc uh robert remembers i believe even the date but it was about a year ago maybe even over a year ago oh, no yeah. it was uh april yeah, 30th uh, 2018. wow a lifetime wow. ago wow, so that was a while ago so yeah, I'm going to do that one again. 
And it's kind of my talk on Buddhism and the beats. So it sort of focuses on the beat generation, Jack Kerouac, his book, The Dharma Bombs. But it's sort of more of a longer history of how Buddhism came to America, what traditions came here first, geographically where they came. And it's kind of a, like a quick crash course on how we got to Buddhism in America today. So that's the talk. Hope to see you there. That's Friday at 7.30 the the kind of normal time <laughs> bring a friend bring your 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 poet friends and you know, your <laughs> your your beats and bums friends and uh i think that's it thank you all for being here great to see everyone yay and thank you michael <laughs> so much thank you all have a great night sleep well i only got to 14. wow <laughs> Yay. Uh, I don't like being so orange. <laughs> that's just a leftover from yeah, it's a little strange. Like a week and a half ago. What's that? My